uh, I'm, I'm so glad that the Lord has, has brought us here together today to, to open God's Word together. Um, and uh, the, the message that the Lord has given me today is called Facing Your Giant. Facing Your Giant. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have today to, to study and to be inspired by, by your word, Lord, as it teaches us um, the, uh, the keys to your kingdom. Um, Lord, I pray that each of us today, as, as, we, as we look at this story, that, that our hearts will be touched, that, our, that we'll be inspired, that, that we will continue to carry on and fight the good fight of faith that uh, you've called us to. I pray that uh, you will speak through me now. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it seems like uh, whatever, wherever we go in life, there we are, right? <laughs> we, can't, we can't seem to get away from our problems because our problems kind of follow us wherever we go. Um, I know sometimes, uh, and I'm not immune to this as well, but we, we have this, this idea that the grass is what? Is greener on the other side. And, and if only this were the way it should be, or if I could be over here or be there, you know, things would be better, things would be different. But you know, the thing that, that, that the reason that's not the case is because wherever we go, someone's following us. The enemy, right? The devil. And, uh, and, and so, uh, yes, God has a plan for our life, and, and, he, and, 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 and it's, it's a very good plan. But at the same time, we're in the middle of a spiritual warfare, right? We call it the great controversy. And, and so that means that, that we are soldiers or we are, are, are uh, actors or actresses in this, in this great play, this, this great battle, this, this magnificent um, um, epic um, conflict between good and evil. And, and so, so until we leave this world, we are always going to be what? Facing we're going to be, yeah, we're going to be facing giants. We're going to be facing uh, advances by the enemy into our territory, into the territory that God has given us. And, and, and so as we look at this story today, um, one that probably a lot of us uh, grew up reading about when we were little kids, and, and, um, but I want us to think of it uh, not just as a little kid's story today, even though I think, I hope the little kids today will, will be able to get something out of it. Um, but, but think about what's going on here. God has, has promised this land to Israel, Right? This, this promised land. And, and so Israel has, has, through Moses, they have, and then eventually through Joshua, they came in and they what? They conquered the land, right? And, and so the land was theirs. They, God had given them this land. And yet, just because God had given them the land didn't mean that there was no more what? No more battles to fight. No more difficulties, right? And, and so we saw that as they, as they lacked they're, they're this, this big picture, they, they, they got caught up in their own personal stuff and they, and they lost perspective of what God's plan was for bringing them into the land, we see that the enemy starts coming in and taking a little bit of land here, taking a little bit of land here, taking a little bit of land here, and pretty soon this great big promised land was shrinking, shrinking down into a much smaller piece of land. And, and, and we see through the, the stories of the judges that that over time, different enemies would come in and, and conquer part of this land, and, and God would, would raise up judges to, to help um, uh, overcome these, these adversaries. But the fact of the matter was that, that Israel was so in focused, everybody was so focused on, on themselves and their own prosperity, they lost sight of the big picture. And so once again, we, we pick up this story in, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, where we see the enemy is once again coming in and taking a, a stronghold within God's territory, amongst God's people. And so let's turn there in, to 1 Samuel chapter 17 now. And this will be where we are most of our study today. 1 Samuel chapter 17. I, wanted, I want you to notice verse 3 as we get started here. It says, Verse 3, the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side and Israel on a mountain on the other side and there was a valley between them. So typical of warfare, 
where is the best place to be if you're going to fight a battle? At least back in these days. The higher ground, right? We even sing a song in, in our hymnal, right? That we want God to place us where? Higher ground. It's the vantage ground, right? So, so you see, you got these two armies. They they're both have the higher ground. And what's between them? The valley. Now, whoever attacks first, the one who's on higher ground is going to be automatically at a what? Disadvantage, right? And so you can see here now, now we see the Philistines, they've come in, they've invaded Israel, they've taken a stronghold in a high place, and, and Saul and his army, they come, and, and they, they see them there, but then they're just having this standoff. Uh, and, and how often um, do we allow the enemy to come into our terrier and take up a stronghold? You know, the, the, the strongholds can be all kinds of things, can't they? Uh, it can be a habit. Uh, it can be a, a resentment that we're holding towards somebody. And, and, and it, it could be just uh, somebody that we can't get along with uh, at work. And, and, and we allow this stronghold in, and, and instead of doing something about it, what do we do? We just stand there and, and, and stare at it. it and, and it becomes this, this big thing. And not only do we see that, that, it, that it's um, in our life, but notice we keep reading... Verse 4, And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistine named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Anybody have any idea how tall that would be in feet today? Huh? Nine feet. That's right. And then the, it's actually, it's, it, it's about nine feet, nine inches tall. Um, so that would basically make all of us in that presence of, of somebody of that s not only height, but you also have the girth to go with it, uh, we would all feel like little kids. Uh, even Daniel over here uh, would, 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 uh, <laughs> would, would feel like, you know, Victoria looking up to Daniel would be like us looking up to, to this giant. Um, and, and so we, we can't uh, really, I think, take into perspective the size of this man. But, but it wasn't just the size. Notice here, uh, if we keep reading, in verse, starting here in verse 5, it says, He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had a bronze greaves on his leg, and bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. So, so not only is this, this giant gigantic, but, but we see that he is fully what? He's fully armored, right? He, he, he's got the, this, this uh, armor male, armor, armor, which no arrow could penetrate, and most swords would just brush off of it. And this, this male itself is... What would weigh 200 pounds. 200 pounds. And that's, that's just his armor. Uh, I mean, that's just this male armor on his chest. Uh, we're, not, we're not talking about the rest of his armor here. And then the tip of his, of his spear weighed 25 pounds. Now, some of you probably do 25-pound uh, barbells for, 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 for working out. But, but imagine being able to throw that on the tip of... Of a, of a sphere and, and, and being accurate with it. I mean, this is quite a, a large, strong man here. So, so we have this, this giant with, with fully armed, you know, he's got a shoe bearer there. Uh, he doesn't even have to carry that. He's got someone doing that for him. And, and so no, notice, notice what we see next here, verse 8. It says, Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. And if he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. Um, and it says here, yeah, let's, let's keep going here. And... Uh, and the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. 
When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and what? It says greatly what? Greatly afraid. You know, we, we talked uh, uh, a couple times ago, remember we studied about that mega peace <laughs> that Jesus can give, you know, when he calmed the storm, mega peace. Now, here we see the, the kind of the opposite of that, right? Mega fear, greatly afraid. And, and so we see this, this giant, he, he's proposing this tactic that was common in the Eastern world. It, it was called a representative battle, right? And, and basically we see that it, a champion from each side would come and, and fight. And whoever uh, won between those champions, uh, would, the, the whole army would win. And, and so he, he's very confident then that, that he could defeat and destroy any, any um, soldier that, that Israel could produce. Um, so how long did he do this? You know, <laughs> it says he did this not just once a day, but he actually came out and, 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 and challenged the army of Israel twice a day, not just, not just for a day or, or a week, but actually he went out doing this for 40 straight days. Basically saying, here I am, come and get me. You know, who, who's mad enough to come out and fight me? And, and you can imagine over time how this must have affected the, the pride and the ego of, of the Israel fighters. You know, uh, you know, when you don't face your giant right away, what happens? It grows, right? It becomes bigger and it seems like less and less likely that you can, you can conquer it. Um, and, and, and so... Isn't that how it works with the giants of our own lives? You know, uh, we see that in our own lives, the giants, that they'll come out and they'll what? They'll, they'll come out and, 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 and they'll defy us. They'll say, I defy you to, to conquer me. I defy you to, to challenge me today. I defy you to, to try to overcome me in your life. Right? It could be... Whatever that giant of our, in, is in our life, that depression or the anger or the lust, the gluttony, the laziness. You know, these different giants. They, 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 they could be uh, an eating disorder. It could be uh, an addiction to alcohol, pornography, or gambling. You know, all these different giants that, that ha we, it, we have left alone and then they become greater and greater and greater. And, and they seem like they're undefeatable. And here they come. It's every day. We face it again. And every day that we let it there and we don't challenge it, it becomes like something that, that we can't overcome. It, it, it messes with our minds. And so this is all going on to Israel, right? We see that this is happening for 40 days. And, and, uh, and now we get to, to learn about David, right? David, um, he, wasn't, he wasn't there, was he? He wasn't there when this was all going on. Um, he was actually too young to, to fight in the army. And so uh, David's dad decides, hey, you know, go check on your brothers. See how they're doing. I'm worried about them. And so uh, David's uh, dad send, sends him on an errand. And he brings some food. And, and, uh, and, and he goes and, and, and he looks to see what's going on. Now, now David... You know, sometimes we picture him as this, like, little 12-year-old boy. Uh, and I, I, I understand why we do that sometimes for, for effect with kids. But, but, you know, David, you know, he, he could handle himself pretty well, right? I mean, he had already done some pretty violent things in his life. Um, and, and actually, he had developed a, quite a reputation. If you go back to, uh, to 1 Samuel chapter 16, 1 Samuel chapter 16 Verses 17 and 18. Now this is, this is before what we're reading about here. But notice here. Uh, so Saul said to his servants, Provide me a man who can play well and bring him to me. Then one of the servants answered and said, Look, I have seen the son of Jesse, the Bethlehem, Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing a what? Mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and handsome person, and the Lord is with him. So, so we see here that David's life had already been exemplary to the point that he had developed a reputation as, a, a, as being quite a, a guy, quite a, quite a guy. Um, and, 
And so David, still, but he's still young though. He's still young. So David comes into the camp. He drops off the supplies. And, and, and you can imagine him coming in there right around the time that Goliath is coming out doing one of his typical rampages where he's, you know, fee fi fo fum you know, here he, here he comes, he's going to, he's challenging uh, the army of Israel. And, and this is the first time David hears it. And I think that's interesting. I think that there's something to that, you know, because if Israel had, had done something the first time, uh, like we said, maybe, maybe uh, they wouldn't have needed David. But because they were afraid, because they didn't have any confidence in, in their God, basically, you know, uh, they held back. And, and so now it's been 40 days. And, and so David hears the, the same thing. But he has a different reaction. Notice verse 24 uh, of chapter 17. It says, all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption in Israel. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? So David's reaction to this, this giant is totally different than, than the reaction of everybody else, isn't it? You know, while everybody else sees the giant, David looks at him at what he truly is in God's eyes, which is... A peon. <laughs> you see, David saw the giant with the eyes of faith. He saw the giant from the perspective of the God he served. Not from his own strength. He was so connected with the living God that, that nothing made him afraid as long as he knew who was with him. As long as he knew his God was with him, he had no fear. He had already experienced God's mighty hand in his life with the lion and the bear, and, and, and protecting him through all those years of, of, of watching the sheep. God had been preparing him. And so, you see, if we were to look into the eyes of our giants in the way that David looked into the eyes of this giant, we would recognize that those giants are already defeated. And we wouldn't be afraid. We wouldn't be afraid. The Bible tells us in James chapter 4, verse 7, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will what? He will be the one that flees, right? Yeah. So, so it, whatever that giant is in our life, you know, when we don't look at it, through the eyes of faith. Yeah. Well, there's nothing we can do. We might as well just try to, to, to stay alive, right? Because if we, it, you know, we don't want to fight it too hard because we know it'll kill us. So, so we, try to, we try to, you know, keep it around, keep it happy, but, you know, uh, but we don't, we don't do something about it. We, we just let it there in our lives and it, and it, and it's, and it, and it's, it just won't leave and, 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 it, and it really affects our spiritual life. And so here the Bible tells us, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from them. So what does that say about the army that Saul had <laughs> established here at this point? <laughs> they, they, hadn't, they hadn't submitted to God, right? They hadn't submitted to God. No one was putting their trust in him, and that's why everyone was afraid. It's the same reason why most of us here get discouraged. It's only when we don't submit to God all the areas of our lives that the, 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 the giants in our life can get us down and get us discouraged. But when we do that, when we truly surrender ourselves to God, then 
we get the power because God's purity is working through us. His, his life is working through us. And of course, anytime you stand up for God, especially when those around you are afraid to do so, you're going to get you're going to get persecuted a little bit. You're going to get picked on a little bit, right? So David here, he, he's, he's being sincere, and his older brother thinks he's being a what? He's being a show-off, right? He's being a cocky little kid, little brother, you know? You can imagine, oh man, what's my little brother doing here? Who does he think he's talking about? You know, he's making a fool of our family. He's going to embarrass us. Just go home. You know, daddy sent you here to bring us some food. Go back to daddy. Go back to the sheep. It's embarrassing. You can imagine it would be embarrassing to have your little brother come and, and, and basically call the whole army a bunch of wimps, a bunch of wusses. <laughs> and you're one of those in the army? And so he gets ridiculed. He gets ridiculed. But, but you know, I think about that in the church. How often do we ridicule people in the church because of uh, uh, of their faith, their vision. They, they see that God can do something. And, and we're just sitting here like, we've seen this giant for 40 days, 40 years maybe, right? And, and we know that this giant can't be defeated. So we're trying to like calm the person down. You know, listen, the, we, the, the giant's there. You know, it's, you, you, can't just, you can't just go in and, and fight him like that. It's not, it just doesn't work like that. Uh, you know, sometimes us who have been in the church a long time and in the faith a long time, um, you know, we think we're, we're trying to help people, but sometimes we're throwing water on, on, the, on God's fire. And, and that's what his brother was doing here. And, but the beautiful thing is that David was too young to know any different. He, 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 was, he was fearless still. He, he hadn't been jaded by the world. And, and he still had that, that, that youth faith. And that's why we need young people in our church, you know, because the young people haven't become cynical yet. At least, hopefully not. Uh, you know, I know, but you, you, it, it, the longer you're in the church, sometimes it's the more cynical you can get about how things work. And, and we get into the organizational structure and, and we look around and we complain about what everybody should or shouldn't be doing. But, but the young, you know, you guys still believe you can do something. And, 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 and that's what we need. You know, a lot of people in our church today who, who believe that we can actually go out and make a difference and, and do God's will. And when we have enough of those, and the old, those of us who are older, if we, if we get out of the way and say, okay, you know, what, what's God doing here? And, and, and allow God to work, you know, amazing things can happen. Um, and just like what we see here in the story. So, so finally, Saul gets word of, the, of, of David, right? Uh, David's like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to fight this guy. And, and so Saul go, comes up and says, all right, you know, I haven't had anybody else for 40 days willing to do it. You know, this guy's as good as anybody else. Um, and so uh, let's pick up here in verse 38. Verse 38. It says, so Saul clothed David with his armor. He put bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. And David fastened his sword to his armor, and he tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. You know, there's something to be said about fighting in our own armor. Amen? Um. Uh, you know, and the way that I, I view this is sometimes someone will come up to you and tell you, you've got to do it this way, this way, this way, and this way if you want to be successful. You know, and, and, you, and you've, got to, you've got to do it just like this. And, and, and that may work for some people, but for others it's a little bit too what? Rigid, Right? You can imagine David here, he's in this armor, and, and Saul's, is he well-meaning? Yeah, he's well-meaning. He's trying to, you know, hey, this guy's going to go get himself killed. Let's l at least give him some armor, you know, so he can last a few minutes in the battle. Uh, but, 
But it wasn't David's armor. It wasn't something that he was used to, something comfortable with. Friends, we don't have to be somebody else when we're, when we're serving God. Amen? You know, you may look up to somebody else in the Christian faith, and you may say, I want to be like them. And that's great to let other people inspire you, but God has made you the way you are for a very specific person, for a very specific reason. He, he doesn't need us to, to clone ourselves after someone else. God has gifted each one of us with certain gifts, and only if we use those gifts can God use us the way that he, he, he created us to be used for. And so it's important that we, when we are, are, are serving God, that we don't try to be someone that we're not. That, that we are true to ourselves and that we serve God in, in, in the way that he has made us and the gifts that he has given us. And there's nothing wrong with, 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 uh, with telling a well-meaning brother or sister to, to say, look, that may have worked for you, but God has inspired me to do it this way. And, and, and we need to, as leaders, also recognize that, that, that we don't have to always be, have everything in control. You know? We can allow others to, to, to work as God leads them. And so David's like, no, I'm not going to do this. And, and not only does he take the only armor off, he doesn't put any armor on. <laughs> He's relying on the spiritual armor. Amen? And, uh, and so what, is, what, what do we see here? Let's, let's go to uh, um, Ephesians. Um, you know, this, this is what Ephesians is talking about. This is our scripture reading today. Ephesians chapter, chapter 6. It says here, verse 13, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand... In the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. You know, when we are, you know, when we're standing in God's armor, what we're really saying is we're, we're putting on Jesus Christ. Um, and, and when you think about Jesus and, and how he lived his life, um, you know, was he constantly in danger? <laughs> Did people want to kill him over and over and over again? That, 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 that were people trying to get in his way of, of doing God's will? Yeah. I mean, all, everywhere he went, I mean, I, even in his hometown, right, they tried to push him off a cliff. You remember that? But it wasn't his time. You remember? He said, my time has not yet come. You see, Jesus had a, an advantage over us. He actually knew when he was going to die, right? He He knew. He knew. It was prophesied. So, so he knew it as he was walking along. He knew that he didn't have anything to worry about because, hey, it's not my time yet. You know, and, and as I follow God's leading, and, 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 and he's going he's gonna to lead me and guide me until I get to that point when it's my time. And you know, we all have a time, don't we? You don't know when that time's going to end. But, if we are putting on the armor of, of God, what we can be assured of is that whatever God's will is for our life, he's going to allow us to accomplish it before our time comes. Amen? Amen. And that's all that matters. Because when Christ comes, he'll say what? Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of the Lord. So we may live a full life, we may not, in terms of this world's perspective. But the important thing is, is that we're putting on the armor of God, and we're not afraid to face the what? The giants. Because if we don't face the giants, if we don't face them with the armor of God, then those giants are going to remain, and we're not going to fulfill God's purpose. Because God has a giant for each one of us to kill. Not just personally, but, 
but in the world around you, you know, there's other people's giants that, that God has called you to, to, to go in and, and help them conquer. But if we're just stuck in our own life, running from our own giants, then are we really good for anybody else? Can God use us to help anybody else? No. See, this giant wasn't just David's giant, was it? It was whose giant? The whole nation, right? I mean, he's the one who, who battled it, but his victory ended up being what? Everyone's victory. Well, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but, but, but we see here. So, so what does David do? Let's, let's go back to uh, um, 1 Samuel 17 again. And uh, let's pick up in verse 40. It says here, Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, and put them in the shepherd's bag, in a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and good-looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you have come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by the gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. You know, <laughs> Goliath and, and, and every, every giant around us relies on their own strength, right? And, and, and they only look at what you can see. See, he couldn't see the spiritual army that was behind David. The, the spiritual armor that he was wearing. He only saw what? This, you know, probably a, you know, one of these good looking guys over here, right? Probably one like that, right? You know, I don't know how old David was, but it was probably, you know, college age. You know, good looking. And, uh, and, and you hear Goliath is this, this really experienced guy. He's probably, you know, I don't know, maybe 40 years old. He's, he's battled a lot. He's got lots of battle scars. And, and he knows how to fight. And he knows that every time he's faced one of these, you know, young kids before, he's, he's done what? He's, he's fed their flesh to the, <laughs> the birds of the air, right? Um, but Goliath was fighting for himself in his glory. But David wasn't. See, that was the difference. David was fighting for his God and for his people. Um, and so notice uh, how David responds. You know, I love this. Uh, sorry, I closed my Bible. Um, verse 45. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you, what? In the name of the Lord of hosts. And the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with the sword and the spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. Whew. That's faith right there. I mean, just think about this. Picture this in your mind. You know, this young kid with no armor, with, with just a sling. And, he, and, and so next what we see is, is, is David actually is the one who starts running toward the giant. And so the giant's like, okay, I'm going to run. But David's the one, he, and you can imagine, he's just throwing this, this thing around and, and it, shoo, boom. Right between the head, right between the eyes, right here in the in, in the uh, in the forehead of the giant. And before the Philistines could blink, their champion was dead. So, you know, when we think about giants in our lives, we have to be aggressive with them. We can't just allow them to stay there and say, "Hey, eventually he'll get." tired or, or he'll move away and start bothering someone else. The giants is, is not going away unless we do something about it, right? Unless in the name of God and, and, and putting on his armor, we go after it full force, not because 
to bring ourselves glory, but what? To bring God glory. And when we defeat the giant, not only are we, do we become free, but we end up freeing those around us who have been uh, also struggling with the same giant. You know, it's interesting. When you overcome a debilitating sin in your life, does God just leave you alone after that? Or does God bring other people into your life that are struggling with the same thing and then allows you to what? Help them conquer their giant, right? And then it, and it goes on and on and on like that. The, the, the effects of, of defeating our giants are exponential because, trust me, God's just waiting for you to, 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 to trust him to defeat it and then he's going to use that victory to help others. So, my appeal this morning, my thought this morning, is that we're all battling, we're all battling giants. I've got them. You've got them. But let's stop avoiding them, right? I mean, that's my appeal. You know, it's kind of like that old thing, the elephant in the room that everybody kind of knows it's there, but we just kind of pretend it's not. Yeah, well, the elephant is our giant, and, and we've all got an elephant, we've all got a giant that we've, we know has been, has been there for a long time, and we've just been kind of hoping it would go away. Um, and so my encouragement to you today is put on the armor of Jesus Christ Amen. and go after that sucker. Amen. And how do we do it? With the Word of God. Amen? Amen. With the sword of the Spirit. And by God's grace, he'll give you victory. And then he'll use your victory to bring victory to others. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the simple story. But yet, it's so profound in terms of our spiritual lives today. Um, Lord, we don't just have giants um, in the physical realm, and yes, we do there, but the Lord, each of us has, has these, these spiritual giants, these um, intimidations, these things that have, have followed us around, taunting us, um, enslaving us, making us feel like we're powerless. Um, and, and, and Lord, they, and, and it has effectively neutered us from being able to do anything significant for you because we're, we're afraid of this giant and, and it's taking up energy that we should be using for your kingdom. I pray that you will um, inspire us today, inspire myself and, and each of us to, 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 to take your strength, Lord, that you give us and, Lord, that, that you will carry us through to the end um, as we trust in you, Lord. I pray that that the giant that we face here as a church will be overcome. And Lord, that, that you, will, you will bless this church. Lord, you will help us to, to, to get outward focused and, and, and Lord, use the victories that we have personally to, to reach those out to those around us and bring them into your kingdom. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is number six.